Welcome to another episode of The Dissection. The Department for Home Affairs has called for space to conclude the citizenship investigation in the Miss South Africa case. Chidima Arenchina, the Miss South Africa contestant, has withdrawn from the Miss South Africa competition. Let's dissect this. Let's start off with the statement from the Department of Home Affairs, where they have called for space to conclude the citizenship investigation. The Department of Home Affairs has said the following. The Department of Home Affairs acknowledges the media and public interest in the ongoing investigation requested by the Miss South Africa pageant. The update provided yesterday indicates that our team is working, is hard at work to establish the full set of facts and committed to communicating those facts in a transparent manner at the appropriate time. To safeguard the integrity of the process, the department will, however, not be commenting publicly again until we're in a position to announce the final outcome of the inquiry. We are committed to concluding the investigation speedily. We also call on South Africans to support our work by safeguarding due process, respecting constitutional rights of all parties at all times, and refraining from inflaming divisions. By upholding these principles, we can rebuild the rule of law together. That's the statement from the Department of Home Affairs. Chidima Adenchina, the contestant who has steered all of this controversy, has also issued a statement today where she has withdrawn from the competition. This is what she had said. She has said, I would like to start off by thanking everyone who stood beside me right from the start of my Miss South Africa journey. I am really grateful for all of the love and support I have been shown. Being part of the Miss South Africa 2024 competition has been an amazing journey. However, after much careful consideration, I have made the difficult decision to withdraw myself from the competition for the safety and well-being of my family and I. With the support of the Miss South Africa organization, I leave with a heart full of gratitude for this amazing experience. I would like to take this opportunity to wish my fellow finalists all of the best for the remainder of the competition. Whoever wears the crown represent us all. So this is the update and this is where things stand right now. What are my thoughts on the situation? What are the questions that arise? I'm going to look at this in the, in the following part of this episode. But before I do that, if you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please subscribe, press like, you know, turn on the notifications. It helps YouTube know that you enjoy this content. It helps others to find this particular content on the channel. So I'd really appreciate that. Thank you so much for all of the support that I got from yesterday's video and all of the respectful engagement that we had. These are very difficult topics, very sensitive topics, but many people participated in the conversation respectfully, giving their views. And even though people disagree, there is a way to disagree that is in pursuit of truth, in pursuit of enlightenment, and not in a way that everyone is seeking to destroy each other and simply just, you know, fern or fan the flames of hatred division. We can improve as a continent and as a people with better dialogue, better discourse. So just thank you to everybody who has been participating uh, in those conversations. So Questions, my thoughts, let's jump into it. The first question is, what is the status of uh, Chidima Adenchina right now? That question depends on a material question of fact about whether or not she has another nationality. Some people have said that she's a dual citizen, but that is not fully clear and it's a pertinent question because I think the discussion about dual citizenship was about her having dual ethnicities, and there may have been a conflation there. But it's a, it's a question of fact, one that has to be ascertained. Why does that have to be ascertained? It has a big bearing on everything else that happens in the coming weeks, months, and years in relation to this particular case and saga. Article 15 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights states the following. Number one, everyone has the right to a nationality. Number two, no one shall be, shall be arbitrarily deprived of his nationality nor denied the right to change his nationality. This provision finds various expressions in South African law and any decision that is taken about a person's citizenship 
is taken in light of these constitutional rights and international um, obligations. So section 20 of the constitution is the first manifestation of the expression of this universal declaration of human rights. And section 20 of the constitution says, no citizen may be deprived of citizenship. Now, let's start thinking about Adinchina. If she has only got South African citizenship, she cannot be rendered stateless, even though her mother may have done something which is unlawful in that her mother may have misrepresented in order to get herself, the mother, citizenship or permanent residency. You, if someone is born in South Africa and they have no other, no other nation state that they can claim at that particular moment, you cannot deprive them of nation status. They cannot be rendered stateless and no citizen may be deprived of citizenship. So deprivation of citizenship is a very complicated thing, which is what I'm trying to put across. Right. Let's look at what Section 6 of the Citizenship Act says. Section 6 of the Citizenship Act says, number one, Subject to the provisions of subsection 2, a South African citizen shall cease to be a South African citizen if a. he or she, whilst not being a minor, by some voluntary or formal and formal act other than marriage, acquires the citizenship or nationality of a country other than the Republic, or he or she, in terms of laws of any other country, also has the citizenship or nationality of that country and serves in the armed forces of such country while that country is at war with the Republic. So this is how you can lose citizenship. Any person, section 262 now says, any person referred to in subsection 1 may, prior to his or her loss of South African citizenship in terms of this section, apply to the minister to retain his or her South African citizenship and the minister may, if he deems, he or she deems fit, order such retention. Any person who obtained section 3 South African citizenship by naturalization in terms of this act shall cease to be a South African citizen if he or she engages under the flag of another country in a war that the Republic does not support. So as you can see, loss of citizenship is most likely to occur if you are in possession of another citizenship, if you participate in wars against South Africa, and if you formally seek and get citizenship of another nation. But if you only have one citizenship, it becomes very difficult for you to lose that citizenship. Section 8 of uh, the Citizenship Act says the following. It says, deprivation of citizenship. The minister may by order deprive a South African citizen who also has the citizenship or, or nationality of any other country of his or her South African citizenship if A, such a citizen has at any time been sentenced in any country to a period of an imprisonment of not less than 12 months for any offense, which, if it was committed outside the Republic, would also have constituted an offense in the Republic. B, the minister is satisfied that it is in the public interest that such a citizen shall cease to be a South African citizen. So, as you can see, this deprivation is around people who have another citizenship or nationality if those people commit particular offenses, right? The department has already stated that Adenchina is an innocent party in all of this in their original statement, which is something that may have legal significance later. If she doesn't have any other citizenship at this particular point, she is not likely to lose it. If she does have it, there's still a formal process that if she has another citizenship, there's still a formal process, as you can see, that must be carried out for deprivation of a citizenship by the minister. And if there are mistakes or there are problems or there are violations of her rights, she can actually seek legal recourse and sue the government, sue the Department of Home Affairs and win. When you start doing administrative law, when you start doing these kinds of processes, you have to really strictly stick to the law. In as much as, you know, people like Adenchina, undocumented immigrants and all of these people who we are talking about in terms of discussions around citizenship, immigration, refugee acts, etc. They have a law that applies to them, but government also has laws that apply to it. And if the government doesn't follow its own laws that apply to government and execution of power, force, etc., 
those those people can still have legal recourse. An example that I want to give you, the Department of Home Affairs just paid 1 million rands to a woman who was unlawfully detained, even though she was unlawfully in South Africa, right? And the background of this is that in 2017, the Constitutional Court declared parts of the Immigration Act to be unconstitutional. The court stated that any illegal foreigner who is detained under those sections which they deemed unconstitutional needs to be brought before a court in person within 48 hours from the time of their arrest and not later than the first court day after the expiry of the 48 hours be um, be brought to that particular court if the 48 hours are sp- uh, expired outside ordinary court days. So this woman was arrested, was detained for a very long period of time without those particular laws being followed. And as a result of that, she went to the courts and said, I was wrongfully detained and my rights were violated. Even though she was unlawfully in the country, her rights under other aspects of the law were violated. And as a result of that, she now has one million rand. So even though it may seem like it's unfair for her to be able to access these particular rights. This this woman was an undocumented migrant. She was able because the law does allow her. So you see, rule of law applies. Uh, it's it applies in two directions, right? To the people, to the government as well, and that is the way it is. So when we speak about rule of law, that also applies to the government, and this is why perhaps we're even seeing um, the Department of Home Affairs speaking in the way that they are speaking. What does this mean for Vanessa's future career prospects? I think there's a mixed bag there. Number one, she is now the most recognizable face from the Miss South Africa competition. Everybody knows her face. If you put up her face anywhere, it's going to spark discussion. People know that face. People know um, know her. In a modeling career, your face is your is your business card, right? Your face is what gets you contracts, deals, et cetera, et cetera. So she may still have um, a modeling career after the fact, after this particular event. She's still very young at 23 and she has a long runway. You know, she has those kind of features, which I guess look like Naomi Campbell. Um, I'm not really a person who's an expert on um, modeling or the modeling space, but obviously she was able to get into the top 10 of Miss South Africa. Now she has a, re- a recognizable face. So she may get opportunities down the road. The risk that I identify in this is that some brands may be afraid of being targeted if they give her opportunities because people will maybe say that, you know, she's now taking modeling opportunities from other South African women or something to that effect. But if she does retain her citizenship, and she is deemed to be an innocent party in all of this, uh, many brands will continue to give her opportunities or will give her opportunities, particularly if, um, you know, her name is cleared. And I think it seems as if she is not going to be blamed for this. Let's talk about the statement from the Department of Home Affairs. The The statement from the Department of Home Affairs in and of itself is worrying. Why do I say this? It's using much softer language about the alleged offenses than the statement from yesterday. The statement from yesterday was very charged up and it was a very robust statement. Well, what could have happened is that they may have received legal advice about the complexity of this matter and hence they are issuing the second statement and toning down the language and trying to mitigate their risks. You know, when you face legal action, particularly different types of legal action, delictual legal action, one of the things that could happen or needs to happen is that if you identify a risk that you potentially have caused to someone else, you do have an opportunity to mitigate that risk and you do have an opportunity to then come to a court and say, look, I realize that, you know, um, I bought this big dog that can bite people, but then I put a chain to mitigate the risk of it biting uh, biting people. I'm using just a secular um, type of example so you can understand it. So this could be a risk mitigation statement to actually say, listen, don't do this, don't do that. We're calling for calm. We're calling for uh, a language to really calm down and we're calling for, um, you know, space. If this lady gets attacked or something happens to her, they may face litigation, especially if the mother is found not guilty, right? Prima facie evidence, it's important to state, is not face is not final evidence. It's face value evidence. It must still be tested. And the law still has strong rules of evidence. This case becomes very complicated because 
the allegations pertain to something that happened in 2001. It's a long time ago, right? So witnesses may not be available. Supporting documents may not be available to prove the state's case if they want to uh, prove a particular case, right? And if you're going to deprive someone of um, something as serious as citizenship, you do have to meet the criteria of rules of evidence. You cannot just do it based on vibes. You cannot do it based on gut feeling. You have to follow the rules and part of those rules are rules of evidence. So um, this is still a dynamic which exists. Another thing that I want to say about the statement, it seems that the statement is is understanding that they still have lots of facts to establish and verify, right? And some people are then asking if the statement issued yesterday was premature. I don't know what you guys think about that. Um, I think it's something that was necessary before the final happened. The final is happening this weekend. And I think the Department of Home Affairs, if they were going to issue a statement, they had to issue it either yesterday or today to give Vanessa time to make a decision. And I think... You know, even though it was a, pr a preliminary statement, a prima facie statement, maybe they felt they didn't have any um, other room than to issue. So what do you think, though? Do you think it was uh, premature? I think another thing about this particular statement from the Department of Home Affairs is that the request for space to me seems to be impossible at this particular point. You cannot get space in this issue because politicians have been talking about it. Celebrities have been talking about it. Not just any politician, ministers, leaders of parties. They've been sending letters. They've been posting. It's been a dominant issue trending for three weeks on social media at the top of South African social media trends. The celebrities who have been speaking about it are prominent celebrities, not just, you know, B-class or C-class celebrities, some of the biggest celebrities in the South African media space. You know, um, podcast hosts who are prominent as well have been speaking about it. So the fact that it has been discussed by ministers, by leaders of opposition, uh, leaders of opposition parties, by prominent celebrities means that really I don't think there's going to be much space. The best thing that can happen here is for a speedy investigation, uh, determination from the minister and for the public to be uh, brought into confidence again. Aside from that, I really think people are going to keep talking about it. It's not necessarily going to uh, have space. I also think that the request for language that is not inflammatory is one that some people are going to listen to, but other people are not going to listen to because some people feel emboldened now. They feel vindicated and they will continue with that language, with that rhetoric because they're like, yeah, my gut feeling was right. Now, where else is my gut going to lead me? And that could be a conversation in and of itself that leads to more inflammation and not de-escalation. Right? So, in so much as it seems that they're still trying to establish all the facts, you know, there are some challenges ahead. You know, people may have died. Uh, a variety of things may have happened. And we need to remember, and I think this is something that we need to keep in mind, is what Section 33 of the Constitution says about just administrative action. Section 33 says everyone has the right to administrative action that is lawful, reasonable, and procedurally fair. And everyone whose rights have been adversely affected by administration, administrative action has the right to be given written reasons. So when a decision is taken, you can't just take it. You have to provide reasons. You have to provide justification. Those reasons have to be shown to have been uh, done in a manner that was lawful, procedurally fair, and the reasons themselves have to be reasonable. And this is where the Department of Home Affairs may face some difficulties because they have to establish the full matrix of facts, provide the full matrix of evidence. And because the system is not fully automated, a lot of uh, systems are paper-based, you may find that some of the evidence that they require may not be there. You know, It's a feature sometimes of uh, the policing system that an unfortunate feature um, that dockets go missing, critical paperwork goes missing. And as a result of that paperwork going missing, you know, people um, get acquitted, people cannot be uh, taken to trial and people cannot be convicted because evidence goes missing. And even in this case, you know, if evidence is missing, you cannot therefore fit, fill in the gaps. You cannot connect the dots in the legal system. Things need to be proven at a sufficient level uh, of of evidentiary burden. And that's something that may prove to be a challenge. We'll see what happens though. I think the chapter around the competition in and of itself is now closed. The conversation 
around the issues of, um, you know, reforms at home affairs, I think are going to continue. The conversations around immigration are going to continue. The conversations around relationships between different African tribes and ethnicities, are, I think, are going to continue. And the conversations also around Afrophobia, xenophobia, I think, are going to continue. And I'm curious, what do you guys think about all of those other strands of the conversation that have been playing out? I'm I'm keen to hear what you think about this whole Miss South Africa saga and whether or not you will be watching Miss South Africa. It feels to me that some people are more interested in this issue, the immigration issue, the nationality issue, more than actually the competition. So now that this lady has dropped out, are you going to be watching? I want to be very honest with you. I personally am not that interested in Miss South Africa. I'm, I'm more focused on the Olympics. I enjoy the Olympics more. I think that modeling competitions have problematic elements in and of themselves. Topic for discussion of another day. But I don't know. Will you be watching? Will you be watching? Let's have a conversation. Till the next one.